Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm Mary Kay Magstead. I'm the Deputy Director of, the, of Asia Society Center on U.S.-China Relations. And I am going to start with a little story, give you a little introduction, introduce our two esteemed panelists, Ian Johnson and Tao Zhang, go into a conversation for about half an hour with them, and then go to your questions. I'd like for this to feel like a conversation with all of us. So be thinking as we go along what you'd like to ask. So when I was a kid growing up Irish Catholic in Minnesota, there was a very hot, steamy summer Sunday morning. And we're sitting in church, and the priest, you know, people are having a hard time paying attention. The priest walks up to the pulpit to give the sermon, and he looks around, and he reads the room, and he says, my friends, if this is Minnesota, what must hell be like? <laughs> Went back, finished the Mass. That was it. And I'm remembering this decades later because he made the point that humans have been thinking about for millennia. What must hell be like? That is the subject of the exhibition that's now in the Asia Society Museum, Comparative Hell, Arts of Asian Underworlds. Um, you can see there, it's, it's actually the first comprehensive exhibition in the United States to explore portrayals of hell across the Asian religion, religious traditions of Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and Islam. Um, and as audience members here today, you'll be getting an email with a code for a free ticket to visit because the exhibition is from 11 to 5, so you wouldn't be able to see it after this event. But please do come back Tuesday through Sunday, and it runs until May 7th. Um, also, another little plug before we get to the meat of this conversation. Um, next week, there will be uh, a, an event here called India at the Crossroads of Legacy and Democracy, 10 in the morning, uh, Wednesday, March 22nd. You're welcome to come to that as well. So people have been thinking about hell for millennia. Um, I actually, in preparing for this, was thinking, like, when did people start thinking about hell? You know, more than half of Americans today believe in hell. 75%-ish believe in heaven, according to a Pew study that was a survey that was done about a decade ago. Um, but what does that mean? It means different things to different cultures and religions. It's meant different things over time. It's sort of morphed as we've moved into a more modern era for some people. Um, but you see interesting overlaps. I mean, hell is rarely, if ever, pleasant. Uh, but if you look at, you know, the Odyssey and the Iliad, there's the underworld run by Hades, and it's not like people having their eyes gouged out and their hearts ripped to shreds or, you know, whatever happens in other hells. You can go back and trace at least a version of hell to Zoroastrianism, which was, you know, an ancient religion that started in somewhere between 500 and 700 uh, BC. Am I getting that right? Roughly. A period when there was a lot of religious thought that emerged, right? And in Zoroastrianism, there was a belief in the duality of good and evil in each person. There was the duality of heaven and hell. Um, that was influenced by ancient Indian and Vedic philosophies and religion, and it spread. It spread you know, when Buddhism traveled from India elsewhere, including to China. Um, and it influenced other religions, including Judaism, which influenced Christianity and Islam. So you can see some of the same tropes, some of the same ideas in terms of what hell is. And then there's also the role that hell plays in cultures in terms of at least uh, an attempt to shape behavior. You know, like if you do that, you're going to go to hell. If you, you know, don't behave well in this life, you will pay in the next life. So in, in pulling this event together, th I thought it would be interesting to talk with two deeply knowledgeable China specialists um, about how hell is seen in China, the role hell has played in China, and what has happened over time in China as um, you know, maybe traditional religious practice was interrupted um, when Mao Zedong was in power and said, you know, religion, you know, is bourgeois and you shouldn't be practicing it. Then people were allowed to re-embrace it to some extent. Um, but 
coming out of that experience with, you know, maybe a different understanding of good and evil and good and bad and, and me what the meaning, spiritual meaning was in their life. So our, our experts here today, Tao Zhang is a scholar of classical Chinese philosophy, uh, Mahayana Buddhist philosophy and cross-cultural philosophy. He chairs at Rutgers University. He chairs Rutgers religion department and also chairs its Center for Chinese Studies, and also co-directs the Rutgers Workshop on Chinese Philosophy and Columbia University's Neo-Confucian Studies Center. Um, his most recent book is The Origins of Moral Political Philosophy in Early China. We have copies here at the back, um, which Tao would be happy to sign after we're done here. Um, Tao has written or co-written books on Buddhism and modern psychology, and on how Freudian theory was received in China. Um, he's now working on different new book projects, including a comparative project on free will, which is actually interesting related, interestingly related to the subject of like how much some, a concept like hell is um, an incentive or disincentive for certain kinds of behavior. Besides his books, Tao has also written many articles for leading Asian and comparative philosophy journals and has contributed to several major anthologies. He serves on the editorial boards of Tao, the Journal of Chinese Philosophy, Confucian Philosophy and Culture, and the Journal of Buddhist Philosophy. Thanks for being here, Tao. Um, and Ian Johnson um, is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for his coverage of Falun Gong for the Wall Street Journal in China, and one of the most insightful and empathetic non-Chinese non observers and writers about China that I know. Um, Ian is an old friend from when we both started reporting in China in the mid-90s when he was first with the Baltimore Sun, then the Wall Street Journal, and later the New York Times. He's also a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. His books include Wild Grass, Three Stories of Change in Modern China, and more directly relevant to our conversation today, The Souls of China, The Return of Religion After Mao. Um, besides speaking fluent Chinese and having lived in China for the better part of two decades, Ian is also fluent in German and has lived and reported in Germany where he wrote the book A Mosque in Munich, Nazis, the CIA, and the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. He's now a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations where he's been writing a book coming out later this year about how history is used to legitimize and challenge Communist Party rule in China. Ian, thanks for being here. Tal, let me start with you, um, and let's go right back to the beginning. So concepts of hell were starting to emerge in different parts of the world. They traveled, some traveled on the Silk Road, some traveled in other ways. How did hell begin, the con conception of hell begin in China? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the uh, early Chinese um, religion we were talking about um, in the uh, in the first millennia, a thousand BC, to about um, the beginning of the of the Common Era, so this is re usually referred to as the the early China period. Um, there was really no sense of a hell in the way that we commonly conceived of. So there was uh, expressions like the Yellow Spring, the Huangquan, and there's uh, there usually the 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 for those who depart, right? For those who are departed. Um, and they sometimes understood that there are these non-physical entity, you know, that they would have two parts. One would go up to the heaven to join the ancestral spirits, and the others would just rot and join the yellow spring. Um, the, the, uh, so there was no sense that there was a place of punishment and judgment on those who were uh, because of what they did, right? It's, that's where everybody, you know, sort of end up in, the, in that kind of thing. So, so the so it doesn't have the sense of merit you have to earn to you know for 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 heaven or you you can you're, you're condemned to to hell. Um, so the I think the one of the really interesting expression this is what I read on, on on Twitter and I thought it was it was actually very uh, very just very interesting is that you know in early for early Chinese male the ideal the goal of life is to become an ancestor. Meaning that it's, you know, this is actually very rich, right? It's, you know, so if you are a male and, you, you know, if you become an ancestor, it requires the whole apparatus that you have to, 
you know, have your own entourage of, you know, of your family and then your children. And once you die, uh, and then the, you know, the, the children would, you know, would, uh, you know, serve these different sort of worship, you know, and these kinds of, you know, rituals and that would be performed in those kinds of ways. So, so that was the, the sort of the, the broadly the landscape. And just quickly, does that come mostly from Confucianism or are there elements of No, this is pre-Confucian. Pre Confucian. This pre -Confucian. Is, this is, okay. This is uh, sort of a, yeah, Confucianism emerged, let's, let's start with Confucius in about, let's say 500 BC in that area. So this is, you know, this is sort of pan-Chinese, if we can call it that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was that. Was that. And, uh, and then the, the idea of, um, of, um, of hell would become more salient um, with the introduction of Buddhism um, mm -hmm. to China, um, which you know, usually people date uh, the introduction of Buddhism around the beginning of the Common Era. And uh, it's, um, so the, um, what the Buddhists did um, was that they didn't just bring hell to China, uh, bring this, this, this idea that the, you know, sort of the through karma. There's the different kind of merits that you know you earn. You know, through, through you know, you if you did something wrong, then the, then you you know you, you're condemned to to these different layers of hell. But they they also brought a problem to which the hell will be a solution, right? So it's in, in order for Buddhism to be accepted by the Chinese, they have to actually introduce a problem which the Chinese didn't really think about before, which is the the problem of ancestral spirits. Whereas before, that the Chinese just you know thought that well, the, you know, you just go to the the ancestral spirit, you join join heaven and and so forth. But then there also there is a sense that there were also those who didn't really have much of a descendants, have children, or they were died in a in a sort of really bad way, and they're just these are the the wandering spirits who didn't really have have any place to go, and then they need to be pacified through these different kinds of rituals, you know, so otherwise they can they can cause a lot of havoc. So now when the Buddhists, you know, were introduced to China, they they sort of made the Chinese more worried about the status of their ancestors. What what happens when they die, you know, and uh, and then given how central the value of filial piety really is, right, and has been uh, for the Chinese, then, the, uh, then that's how they introduce the sort of the sets of kind of rituals, the sets of kind of uh, things in order to allay that kind of concern. And uh, so the, the, the idea of a more, much, much more elaborate conceptions of hell will be introduced through that kinds of way. And, and, th and then there, the, once Buddhism become more, you know, sort of popularized and, and propagated and, and through these different kinds of ways. Uh, and then these very graphic depictions of hell gets to be sort of um, performed and uh, gets to be depicted through, through you know, different arts and, and theaters and, and so forth. So that, that's how this gets really, gets to be really, really colorful and complicated. Yeah, so. in fact, I, I found an excerpt about like the, the concept of the 18 hells uh, 18 different levels of hell that started in the Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. um, the, actually, the Buddhist text Sutra on questions about hell mentioned 134 worlds of hell. Oh, yeah. um, the Buddhists but, love numbers. Yeah. But the, these, a, these, yeah. these yeah. include, just, numbers, just, just, that... just to give you a sampling <laughs> of some of what you might experience in this kind of hell, which incidentally, you don't you're, it's not necessarily eternal. You are there long enough to pay to atone or at least to pay for your bad behavior in, in your life as a, a, a mortal. Being steamed, being fried in oil cauldrons, being sawed into half, being run over by vehicles, being pounded in a mort mortar and pestle, being ground in a mill, being crushed by boulders, being made to shed blood by climbing trees or mountains of knives, having sharp objects <laughs> driven into their bodies, having hooks pierced into their bodies, being hung upside down, drowned in a pool of filthy blood, being left naked in the freezing cold, being set aflame or cast into infernos, and it goes on. Really pleasant place, a yes. A lot of imagination mm -hmm. went into this. Oh, yeah. So what was the reason for that? Why so much attention into all the terrible things that could happen to you? I mean, how much was this to try to shape behavior? So there are different theories about this. One of the, one of the theory is that the Buddhist, um, at least the lead Buddhists, uh, were engaged in certain kinds of visualization practice. So these kind of conceptions of hell provide the kind of guidance for the Buddhist, uh, these especially elite Buddhists, to engage in the kind of um, practice that when you, when you visualize, for example, the body, 
going through these really nasty kind of transformations. And, and, uh, uh, and then it's supposed to cultivate this kind of mentality of detachment, mm. right? That, you know, that it's, you know, that, that whatever it is that we cherish, it actually, it's not going to last. It, it, you know, it's going to decay. It's going to, and then it's, you know, so, so it's a kind of visualization meditation practice. So that's for the elite level. But then for the, for the more popular level, these are uh, specifically meant to guide people, you know, to, you know, to behave well, to do, to do the right things, to, to, to be, to, you know, to be more, to be moral and, and so forth. And though, so you, you make it, you know, you make the price of doing something wrong really, really high. And even if you're not caught in this life and you're going to be caught in the next life. And, um, and, uh, and then one of the, one of the features of the Chinese conceptions of hell is that it's very bureaucratic, right? It's, mm. you know, it's almost like organized in the way that the Chinese hell is state the Chinese bureau- bureaucracy. Exactly. It's it's almost it kind of the and and neither worldly you know ex- expression of that kind. Um, so so if you didn't suffer the kind of hellish you know so bureaucratic um, um, pain, then yeah, there's more waiting for you. So yeah, so that's yeah, so that that's 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 the that's the the theory that that that, that I think makes sense. Okay. So fast forward to the 20th century and to 1949, <laughs> in particular, when the Communist Party and Mao Zedong come to power. Mao says the Chinese people have stood up, and he also says that the practice of religion is not compatible with the practice of communism and everyone should be good communists. So this is a question for each of you. Um, What do you think that did to people's sort of moral universe, moral compass? Did it just kind of go underground and the beliefs were still there that were guiding or shaping or was it kind of a personal upheaval for a lot of people, not just in terms of what they actually experienced, but in terms of what they believed? Um, well, you know, so I think the one thing that's worth noting is that Mao didn't come out of a vacuum with his views, and that this really this self-doubting of Chinese religion started it was an elite sort of project in the 19th century that China was going through a ser- through tumult and turmoil and foreign invasion, and that there was something wrong with the culture. And we see this in, in other places as well. Similarly, in the Ottoman Empire, Islam began to be seen as, as a problem, a reason for that area's backwardness, and so Ataturk, for example, then attacked religion as a, as, a, as a backward relic of the past that was holding back the modern Turkish state from modernity. And so the communists were pre- predated by the KMT, who had similar views, but they just weren't really in power long enough, and they were, of course, in civil war and in war with Japan and so on, so they couldn't really carry out some of their ideas also. Um, but I think the main thing to, to keep in mind is the vast destruction of the physical infrastructure of traditional Chinese religious belief in the 20th century. So there's kind of these, you know, estimate guesstimates of the number of temples in China in the late 19th century. Um, you know, the, the religious question of modern China by Gosar and Palmer. So they've estimated in the late Qing, there was something like a million temples. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but then again, you know, there were like a million villages in China is probably undercounting it. They think that half of them were destroyed by the middle of the 20th century already. So before the communists took over, half of them had been destroyed. And then in the Mao era, the rest of it kind of gets either destroyed or closed down. And you can see a city like Beijing, where there's very good survey work. Um, there was you know, like 900 temples um, at the end of the imperial era. And I mean, even today, with temples being rebuilt, I don't know whether 20, 30 temples, if you include the greater you know, suburbs and stuff like that. And some of the biggest things, that, you know, some of the greatest losses were in these practices that were seen as not, not real religious practice. So they, when they began to define religion as something acceptable for the state, they used Christianity as a norm. So you know, a proper religion has a book that you worship, you go to a certain place on a certain day of the week, you have a professional or semi-professional clergy that looks after it. And so in that definition, some elements of Buddhism could be acceptable and some, and Dao, some elements of Taoism could be acceptable. But the vast majority of traditional Chinese religious practice was deemed to be superstitious. And so like if you think in Beijing, there was an enormous temple – 
to the underworld, um, uh, right near the foreign ministry, not surprised. Um, <laughs> well, let's not go there. Uh, anyway, and, uh, and it's across from the East Peak Temple, which still exists, the Dongye Miao, which still exists in Beijing. Um, and it still has some of these images that you talk about, these sort of papier mache statues of people having their tongue cut out and stuff like that. But there was an even bigger temple just across the street, which was completely destroyed. All these things were seen as kind of backward relics. And I think uh, this had a, a profound impact on, on how people experienced their religiosity. Now, you know, exactly what people thought in, the, in 1950s China, there's no survey work, so we can't exactly know. But you can see this effort to rebuild it after Mao dies in 76, starting in the late 70s with the reconstruction of religious life. Um, and so I think it shows that there was an effort to rebuild some kind of a moral universe, but that something had been really lost. And this is reflected, of course, in novels and movies and things like that that we can use to sort of gauge the psyche of a country. Oh. Right. So the we know that humans are embodied beings, right? We're not just um, sort of psychological. We're, we're fully embodied being, which means that it's, um, you know, with the radical changes in the sort of physical nature of our surroundings, our sort of mental and our spiritual life necessarily changes. But of course, the challenge is to really to, to understand the exact mechanism, the, the sort of the exact nature of that change. To what, and, and the, uh, so from the Mao era, I mean, of course, the, the, the sort of the, uh, the communist ideology of atheism, that was still, that, that was the, the dominant uh, move. And so the destruction of temple uh, as, 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 you know, sort of accelerates under an, in that regime. Um, and so, and to this day, China remains the largest, the, the country with the, the highest number of atheists, right? Which, you know, that it's, you know, it's not surprising uh, given the, uh, the, the the history of communism, and also the the sort of the status of religion in pre-modern China, even in in sort of the pre you know sort of twentieth century itself is actually a complicated problem because actually scholars think that the Chinese religion is a much more sort of diffused kind of uh, phenomenon rather than sort of these uh, specifically in this kind of institutional in the way that Catholic Church you know, let's say right in the in, in, in the way that these other sort of much more institutionalized form of Western religion uh, sort of function so so th so it's you know the the landscape of religion was much much more diffuse to begin with so there was no like the Pope so to speak in you know ever in in, in Chinese history right it's you know so there was no Buddhist Pope um, there was no Taoist Pope and it was I mean there are different lineages and but but then there was no central uh, authority central religious authority that can that can challenge the political authority right that then that was never the case in in Chinese history and that of course is it has has a lot of implications. So historically, the emperor was is sometimes translated as the theoc, meaning that it's the that's the sort of the uh, that's kind of a religious. So the, the the traditional Chinese sort of the idea of the state was actually more theocratical than it's sometimes sometimes understood. Meaning that it's that this is the emperor as the son of heaven, right? That uh, who alone connects with the transcendent realm and whose mandate you know sort of legitimates the the regime I mean that's the that's the sort of the 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 overall sort of kind of structure that the emperor alone would have access to heaven the as the the sort of legitimator of a regime and that you, you see the in the in the temple of heaven right in in Beijing now and and then that's when you see the kind of you know there is a center that the emperor on you know certain occasion would stand there and then were able to pray to heaven and that's how that's how the access uh, to heaven was established sort of physically in, in in that sense so the was all of that sort of wiped away in some ways in the in the in the 20th century especially in the uh, in in the later in the you know beginning of the 50s and and, and so forth ending in in the early uh, in in the late 70s um, all of that's been wiped away. But does that mean that it's the, ch the, the, the Chinese spiritual life has changed? Yes, it does. Of course, it has changed dra drastically. So there was no sense of 
a transcendence in the case of either a heaven or a hell in, in, in sort of regulating human behavior. But then that in some ways, those kind of functions will be sort of transformed into other parts of the way that the state can be, you know, is instituted. Right? So it doesn't have to be afterlife. It could be just in the way that the, that, that the, that the life is regulated in this world itself. Like so, Mao was kind of deified. Yeah. And like if you, if you dropped your Mao badge, that, that was sacrilegious. Right? Oh, yeah. There's definitely Maoism has a very strong religious components to it, if we could call it that. It's, you know, I, I call it sort of a theological kind of, you know, kind of belief that, it's, that, they, that there is a very strong element of voluntarism in you know in Maoist communism, right? It's you know that, and it's a and it's always the spirit. You know, it's always the spirit. It was like it's supposed to be a materialism, but it's you know it's the emphasis on the spirit is very very striking in the the Mao in, in Maoism, and and a lot of people and you know in the way that you know people worship Mao, right? You know, but that you know it's it's just like worshiping other kinds of charismatic leaders or cult leaders and, and so it's it's similar in that way so there are certainly certain sort of structures that are that are similar so in some ways that kind of religious energy was redirected towards the the cult of Mao mm -hmm. um, under under those kinds of circumstances so when when the death of Mao happened sort of of course that's going to be a very catastrophic you know events in many ways yeah so, so then the Gaiga Kaifang reform and opening up period began mm -hmm. and you were growing up then. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did, just from your personal experience, how did you see people grapple with the question of, okay, well, what do I believe in now? What do I want to embrace? What, how do I? The truth is we didn't. At least I don't remember grappling with that or, or my family or the people that I knew because it wasn't, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't on the consciousness. It wasn't mm. something that we, we were dealing with. It was just like whether there's, meat on the on the table you know and there wasn't whether, very you know, often over you know sort of like there's not enough yeah. like material on on, on the uh, so that that's sort of it's a very impoverished kind of state but then it's but then when i thought about it um there are these moments when religion or in in our traditional understanding of religion sort of sneak up on you know on people like you know in my dad right it was not a really religious person or my family it was really not a religious kind of family just like standard, typical Chinese family. You know, when my, his dad, my grandfather passed away several years ago, and um, you, know, it, you know, according to this sort of traditional ritual that you were supposed to perform, you know, these kinds of rituals after se several days of the passing of the father, and that the son needs to perform these rituals, and my dad was probably just lazy, and people, he was like, okay, whatever, I, you know, he'd rather, he was busy, you know, so he'd rather not do it. Um, but, um, but then he had a dream that his father was complaining to his, why didn't you come to see me? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, oh my gosh. So he just dropped everything and just go back and, you know, and do the, do the thing, do and as if, as if to, to pacify the spirit. So it's, you know, so that, I mean, for a, for, for him, this is a more sort of direct sort of experience rather than, you know, something that he believed in. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. What, what got you interested in studying religion yourself? I have no idea. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, I really have no idea because, um, I mean, I, I, it, it just, you know, maybe I'm a Buddhist on this. It's just dependent origination. These different kind of, you know, weird circumstances that just push me in. A, you, sometimes you run into different friends, you know, and uh, different teachers and, 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 and so forth, you know. So I wasn't sort of, purposefully just trying to lead in a, in a particular way. So I wasn't really searching in some way. In some ways, the, the past, you know, was just, just fell, fell. I, mean, I don't, I don't, I have no idea. So I don't really have a good story about that. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, should, I should think about it more. You've got to make one up. For yeah, sure, I'm going yeah. to make, I'm gonna make <laughs> one up, yes. So, so Ian, around the time that we both started reporting in China, I got there a year, a year and a half after you, um, there was the first of, I was, talking with you guys about this a little earlier, there, there was the first of two surveys that I found quite interesting. In fact, the first story I did in China um, in, in the mid-90s was um, something on this survey, which was, it was done by a, a private survey company, which was very unusual in China at the time. In fact, I think it was the first private survey company. It was run by a former government official, um, Horizon Group, um, run by Victor Yuan. 
he asked people in several cities in China, it was a, a pretty large group of people, um, but it, you know, still one survey, uh, you know, at one moment, not in rural areas, which most of China still was at the time. Most people still lived in rural areas. But he asked people, what do you believe in? And the top answers were myself, money, and nothing. Um, most organized, well, I think all, no organized religion got more than a single digit percentage of you know, people saying, yes, I believe in this. Communist Party got somewhere between 2 and 3% of people saying they believe. He did the same survey 10 years later, and um, the, the top three answers then were, if I remember correctly, fate, luck, and myself. But the, the number of people who said that they self-identified as believing in a particular religion had doubled. Um, Communist Party was still getting 2 or 3% at the time. So again, it's just a snapshot. It's just one survey. But I found it very interesting in terms of what it suggested about some of the ways that China was changing and some of the ways that Chinese people were starting to look for meaning or at least asking themselves about, you know, yeah, what do I believe in? I, I was increasingly hearing people when I came back to China, I was gone for a couple of years, came back in the early 2000s, um, and, and I was hearing a lot about how, you know, like just the morality, morality people's morality is not what it used to be. Um, Ian, you, you know, obviously engaged with many of these same issues as you, you know, wrote over the course of time as a journalist in China and as you worked on your book, The, the Souls of China. Um, what stood out to you in terms of what people were searching for? And pulling this back to our subject here, um, Hell in China, I mean, like, to what extent was a belief, a belief in an afterlife um, something that was part of that, like, is this all there is? Like, what is yeah. there after this? Do I need to ground what I do here in either a desire for mm. a better life afterward or a fear of a worse life afterward? Yeah, I mean, so I, Victor Yuan, the, the person who did that survey work was really interesting. He was or is practicing Christian and his, his use of words is somewhat, in, this, in the question is somewhat problematic because he says, you know, like, what do you mm. believe in? Like a literal translation. But it's not that useful in, in the Chinese context to use that question because um, it's much more telling other survey work which, have been, which has been done on what people do and on specific concepts. Like, do you believe in bowing and karmic retribution? So then you get like very high numbers of people. 50 to 60 percent of people say yes. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but uh, you're probably familiar with the survey I'm thinking of uh, done by. Uh, anyways, um, so there's that, that's, that's sort of like one thing. And I think in terms of what people, the priority they put on the afterlife, maybe it's interesting to think of what they rebuilt after the Cultural Revolution. And those were often funerary practices. That's the one thing that really survived, that really came back the strongest, even in places like Beijing, more among working class families, but like this, I, I'm working now on a, a PhD about religious associations in China, and they are all pretty much working class people who, you know, they have their sort of history going back to the Qing dynasty or something like that, but basically they were all reformed in the 1980s, and they all performed fu at, at funerals uh, of people. And so this would be, um, you know, their performance associations, so they'll do things like stilt walking and, and other things that could be seen as folk practices, but they do it, they did it primarily in the 80s and 90s, underground, not approved by the state. Now this is approved by the state as intangible cultural heritage and given the sort of imprimatur of state approval, but it was primarily at funerals. And then in the countryside, um, in the souls of China, one of the families that I looked at are uh, lay Taoist <coughs> priests in Shanxi, and they're the, the, the destruction of the, of the physical, of the temples was unbelievable. Many of the villages had four, five, six temples. Now in the whole county, the, you know, up until recently, there were just maybe four or five or six temples. Um, and, but people all wanted to have a proper funeral. And so they would hire them to, to play music and to uh, construct the, the uh, coffin, which is still built with a high 
bow to look like a ship and paint it, and they spent a lot of money on on this um, because it's seen as crucial for you know bringing the soul over to the other side. And so I think this idea of the afterlife still really matters. And then also trying to rebuild um, grave sites, which were often destroyed in the Mao era. Um, they would hire these lay Taoists to do the uh, feng shui, the, so the, so the ge ge geomantic uh, work to, to reconstruct where the funeral plots should be, where the tombstones were for tombs that were maybe you know knocked over and the tombstones smashed, and to rebuild this. So this all sort of has come back, and, and especially with the prosperity, has allowed has allowed people, even in poorer parts of the country like that, to rebuild some of that. And I think it is telling that it's it's about the it's about the afterlife. Like that's the main that's the first thing that people um, try to fix. No, no wonder, right? Because we're all sort of wondering what comes next and trying to you know make sure that our ancestors uh, are treated properly in that. In, in your conversations with people when you were working on that book, I mean, like, what came up in conversation about hell beyond that we're doing these rituals? But, like, did, did you feel like people felt like, I'm very conscious of this being a possible future for me if I don't act the right way? You know, I didn't hear people say, I'm worried I'm going to go to the eighth level of hell and have my tongue impaled by a wild boar or something That's like a very that. specific <laughs> thought. Yes. But they were, um, I do think that there were, there is this idea of, again, sort of like karmic retribution uh, in a more abstract sense than perhaps, because maybe because these temples often don't exist anymore, so people don't see this stuff. Um, and they're not as aware, perhaps, unless they are, better educated and have looked at, say, you know, books that have pictures and stuff like that. But I do think that this idea that you reap what you sow, and the Christian says, you know, it's the same idea. It's probably a universal human idea, or very common, at least in many cultures. Um, and that's quite common. So that, that was one thing. Trying to live a good life. What is a good life? How do I live a meaningful life? Those are the things. Like, what is beyond... Like, when you were growing up, you are saying that the key was getting enough to, you know, the basic human necessities. And then I guess by the 90s and 2000s, for the majority of Chinese people, those questions had been solved. And so then you begin naturally to look at the other profound issues that, that uh, have always perplexed humans. Yeah. And in many societies, once people rise higher in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, often, but not always, fewer people practice religion. I mean, certainly in Europe, uh, there's been, you know, a secularization of, of society. Um, how I know you said that China has the most uh, atheists in the world, but as a percentage, I'm not sure if that's the case compared to Europe at, at this point. I mean, it feels like, you know, both from my experience living in China for 15 years, but also from what you've been talking about, that there's there's sort of, embedded cultural practice that maybe bleeds over into belief, even if it's not the belief part isn't front and center. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Yeah, so so it's the, the, the Chinese, at least traditional Chinese culture, tends to be, it's very, very ritualistic, right? Mm -hmm. so, the, so the ritual aspect, and that's, it's, 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 you know, the concept of ritual, it's, it was considered to be like the, the dividing line between the Chinese and the non-Chinese. I mean, that really is the is what makes Chinese Chinese, right? So you perform these rituals, and of course, um, the one of the most important ritual was the uh, the uh, the death ritual, the and the mm. or the ancestral and uh, ancestral you know rituals, and and the the funeral rituals. These are really important ritual occasions. So I think those kind of practice uh, still um, sort of retain their significance and. And so, for what Ian was talking about, the uh, you know the the the, the funeral ritual, uh, when you know you recruit um, the Taoists or the Buddhists, you know, priests to perform um, the the ritual, and that is in many ways a sort of tied into the the traditional the belief that it was the uh, the you know the uh, these priests have certain power to mediate between this world and, and the next world, such that if it was performed properly, uh, it can aid the, you know, the departed. Mm 
uh, into having a better, you know, either a better rebirth or a, a better abode, you know, in, in terms of the, the, where their, their soul is headed. So, yeah, so there's, there's definitely that. And, and also there's, the, uh, at least in the, in the traditional landscape, there was all of these interesting stories about people who traveled into the into the dark world and come back right and returned and then recount what they saw and those you know you see these uh, one of the most famous example was the the, the mu lian jiu mu you know so the mu lian um who saved uh his mother and mu lian was one of the you know the the close one of the closest disciples of the of the buddha um and he was known have for his you know supernatural powers and 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 he once he was sort of surveying the heavens, you know, the, and, uh, and the different realms, and in order to find his mother specifically. And he found that his mother was, you know, suffering in a really bad place, in a, in a, in a really low in an Avicii hell. And so, so, he, so he had to really, you know, so he, he obviously was upset, and because he, he thought about, you know, his, his, uh, what, what his parents had you know, did for him and to, mm -hmm. you know, so then he obviously wanted to, wanted to save his mother from suffering. So he begged the Buddha, you know, sort of say what, you know, what can be done. So the, you know, so the Buddha would say, well, um, you need to perform certain rituals and also be charitable, to be supportive of the monastic community. And, uh, and then don't, you know, and that would, that would help alleviate the suffering of the mother. And so this, this is the, again, this is the way that the Buddhists, you know, sort of, you know, sort of community and, you know, use that kind of t story in order to propagate itself to say that, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, this is the, the value of following the, uh, the, the practice in, in that kind of sense. And, 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 there's, and there's so many different versions about this, about the story um, and, and the different, uh, and, and the story will get much, much more elaborate as time goes on. And then it becomes theatric performances, and uh, and all the way to the Qin Dynasty, and uh, and there was even a revival, you know, sort of in a in a, in a more in a, in a, in a, during the Reform era. Uh, so so there so that's that kind of that kind of practice is still um, very much in the air. Does anyone have questions? We've been talking a little longer than I had uh, thought we would, but great conversation. Thank you both. Yeah, way in the back. I think there's a microphone somewhere. Oh, there. Yeah, you can. Just oh, it's here. It's coming out right now. <laughs> this will allow people who are watching this later to actually hear your question. Recently, oh, sorry. No, it's on. Recently, um, the Chinese Communist Party issued a report about corruption in government. And they said one of the main uh, factors for corruption was government officials who took on a mistress, because a mistress is a very expensive uh, activity to take on. Um, and uh, what I was wondering is, everywhere you go in Myanmar and in, in Thailand and perhaps in uh, Sri Lanka, where there's a strict Buddhist tradition, there's images of hell in the temples, particularly for, for men who stray from their marriages or abandon their children. And I was wondering, um, does this, this um, as an uh, incentive to drop your mistress or to not encourage a relationship with a mistress and therefore not engage in corruption or uh, the violation of the public good, is this, uh, this hell is brought up as a concept, as a, as a kind of a, an, in, a, an incentive not to get itself involved in entanglements like this. Uh, and I was just wondering, is this, does that promote the idea of hell in certain places in Asia? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I mean, so I don't think Xi Jinping's about to build a new, you know, 18 level temple of hell to <laughs> discourage uh, corrupt officials and stuff like that. But I mean, I do think that, um, yeah, I do, I, I do think that those, that the government does want to use traditional ideas to some degree to moderate, to change people's behavior still. 
um, or to moderate people's behavior, influence people's behavior. And Confucianism, most of all, at the um, moment, right? Yeah, Confucianism. Um, I think it's, if we look at religious policy now, it pretty much uh, sees Christianity and Islam as a problem, but the so-called traditional religions, Buddhism, Taoism, and even the folk religion as, a, as desirable or at least more acceptable. Um, and so, you know, this... The, yeah, the Neo-Confucian philosopher Wang Yang Ming, there's a, a theme park built to him, and Xi Jinping has <laughs> lauded him as a person who has the right moral precepts. So I think they're willing to go down that path a little bit, but not too far, because they still primarily see themselves as a communist party. And while it's okay for other people to believe in religion, theoretically, uh, they don't want to really endorse it too strongly. Right, and... and Usually, the you know, especially now, I would have seen uh, um, the that the the party will be very wary of the party members being you know sort of believing in a in a religion for you know sort of entering the church and, and so forth. So that's especially right. It, yeah, right? No. I mean, that, that's that's actually not uh, really not looked upon very fondly. Yeah, and and also uh, just uh, Confucianism is not categorized in in China as a religion. Right. Right, so so, that, so it, right. it has a different so it has a different kinds of category, and right. it turns out these categories are super important, you know, in the way how how the state approaches it and how the state regulates it. Yeah, so. yeah, because uh, these a lot of these traditional practices have been rehabilitated. They were once called superstition, you know, misian, and now they're called intangible cultural heritage, a, a designation taken from UNESCO. Right, um, so right. you see, like this Taoist, um, these lay Taoists that I mentioned that perform music, they're they are now a national level intangible cultural heritage practitioners. So it's a little bit like the state sees them as the equivalent. If you think of like Bach, you know, you could, you could think of Bach as only being a musician who's performed in a concert hall, but you could also see him as uh, a composer of sacred music that was uh, performed originally in churches and stuff like that, overwhelmingly. And it's the same, by the, the same way the state is willing to rehabilitate them as secular figures, but actually their function is religious. And I think the state kind of knows that, but it doesn't, want to endorse religion that much, so they let it go. Yeah, other questions? Um, what, so, yeah, go ahead. There. Hi, I was, I was interested in what you said earlier, just picking up on what you said, that the state in many ways rechanneled religiosity through its institutions. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, or the function of hell. Uh, are you Yes, you, you oh. mentioned that earlier on, so I'm just picking up on what you said and ask if you could say a little more about that. Oh, Thank uh, you. I see. So the, I, I, I think I, I was talking specifically about the, the during the Mao era when, when these uh, sort of uh, temples and, and churches, they're being de demolished. And so, so then the, uh, you know, the, the, so the, the, so the state absorbed these, you know, these kinds of function. And, and of course now the focus of devotion is Mao itself, uh, Mao himself, right? So that was that was really the, the sort of the the kind of mechanism, and 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 Maoism would become the kind of messian, messianic kind of movement, and uh, and and the the, the kind of uh, that takes on a lot of the sort of the religious, you know, the the, the religious features. And in some ways, the Communist Party has a certain sort of state church feature to it, right? If I can call it that, right? Because if you think about it, there's the party and there's the, there's the state. And, you know, sort of the, they have a parallel kind of, they have a very parallel kind of institutions. And then the, the party is the one that provides the spiritual guidance, right? And that, that, that is really the, where the, the sort of the spiritual, and so you, you see the sort of the spirit the spiritual reform, the, the, the tam, you know, fight against contamination, fight against corruption, all of these are issuing from the party, which is supposed to be the sort of the guardian spirit, right, of, of, the, of the Chinese people. And it provides the, it's the vanguard of the Chinese people, and it sort of provides the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the sort of the institutional sort of guidance for the way that the state is functioning, so it's so in some ways it's a it's it, it's kind of, it, it's sort of channeled in that particular way. That's that's the way I see it. They've even called some of these efforts spiritual civilization it, oh, exactly. campaigns oh, in the exactly. mid nineties. Exactly. So so the so the, the party has a very distinct sort of religious uh, nature to it. Mm. You know, sort of 
you know, or, you know, sort of, I call that atheological, right, you know, so it's versus theological. So that, it's, that, that a lot of the sort of ideological discourse was, you know, has a very distinct religious, you know, aspect to it. Thank you. Given what you just said, what is the role you think of, or what is the future of other religious practices, especially like the residents of Xinjiang or Tibet? And is this, are, are there practices, do you think they'll continue maybe covertly? Or do you think it'll just go by the wayside? Thank you. Should I? Should I? Uh, so, so the the Chinese state always has a um, uneasy relationship with religious institutions, if not practice, right? And this is the this is this has historically been the case. Um, I mean, not it's not a recent phenomenon. And the Chinese state is always worried about alternative sources of legitimacy of spiritual you know, legitimacy. And the, so the Chinese state would never allow uh, an, an institution that's independent of the state that has its own authority. Whether that authority is religious or ethical, moral, or something else, technical, or whatever else, right? So, so then it's so long as, and, and during the reform era, of course, the, there, um, The state has opened up um, more space for these heavily, re and heavily regulated uh, religious institutions that they can sort of operate. They can admit members. They can, you know, run their thing as long as they are part of this, you know, sort of a state apparatus that's very sort of heavily state regulated by, you know, heavily regulated by the state. Then that's that's okay, and the state can monitor, can you know, can um, you know, can watch over what's going on. But if you have an alternative authority, if you, if you are underground, which means that you are not under the purview of the state, um, at least not formally, and, if you, and, and, and other kinds of, you know, sort of religious leaders that doesn't uh, succumb to the, uh, to the authority of the state or the party state, then you have a problem. That's why the, 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 the conflict between the Catholic Church in you know in Rome and uh, and China the relationship it's really really hard to you know to to negotiate because it requires that you know that the Chinese you know, the party that the state would cons would accede that the power of appointment to an external authority which the party would never allow. So that's definitely true, and then on top of that, there's of course the ethnic. Differences, oh, yeah. oh, so oh, yeah. I, you know that we're Tibet and, and Tibetans and, and Uyghurs are Uyghurs much more than Tibetans are seen as other and somewhat suspect, and so right that falls into these alternatives, right? And so yeah. so it's it, it doesn't even matter whatever there is an alternative source of authority of spiritual authority, then the, the state is going to crash it. It's going to crush it. It doesn't even matter whichever, you know, whatever ethnic group, or it could be Han, they will crush it just the same way. It's, you know, it, that, it, it's, it, it, in any ways, that, that's, that's the sort of the, the way that it has always been the case, that the, 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 the Chinese state, the imperial state was like this, you know, in many ways, too. Ian, did you want to add anything? No, I would just think um, that they view, referring specifically, say, to Muslims and, and, and Xinjiang, Xinjiang, it's, of course, there are more Muslims than just the Muslims in, in Xinjiang and China, but I think they would view the, the state views the Abrahamic faiths as particularly problematic because they have outside sources of legitimacy more so than the so-called indigenous religions, such as Buddhism, which, of course, we know originated elsewhere. But um, they would say, you know, Islam has the global ummah. Um, you're supposed to make a pilgrimage. You make your, the Hajj, you're supposed to go to another country. Many people go to, would, were in the past going to study at madrasas elsewhere. This takes people out of the Chinese system. And the same with Christianity. You mentioned Catholicism, that's obvious. And then in Protestantism, there's no obviously no hierarchy like that. But there are there's the global Protestant church. There's people who many Chinese Christian pastors went to study at seminaries in this country. Or, or elsewhere, or sometimes in Southeast Asia, like Malaysia as well. And then they all, all these material, uh, say the evangelical church movement, the 
material has been often translated into Chinese and then sent back to China. And so they view this as a foreign in influenced religion. And so they see that as particularly problematic. But you're right. It could also be like in the case of Falun Gong, it was Chinese people. And in the case of Christianity, it's also ethnically Chinese people. But it, there's a particular vengeance, I think, in Xinjiang because of the ethnic component. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was my question. <laughs> Thank you for answering the question. Um, but so, so I guess that my follow-up question is: so, what is the what is the end game? How do the uh, the outside religions um, make a, a greater impact? Uh, is it uh, a regime change in in uh, in China, or um, let's say what happens next if if you're Catholic or some type of outside uh, um, entity? looking to make a greater impact within the, the, uh, the country? Well, so I guess it depends whether... I, I, sorry, it's looking <laughs> it at me. <laughs> That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> it depends whether you are within the church-recognized Catholic Church, which or the, the Communist Party-recognized Catholic Church, or whether you're in an underground church. And if you're in the former, you have room to practice. You just can't recognize the Pope's authority. Um, for a long time, there was kind of an understanding with the Vatican where, you know, they'd kind of select their, their bishops and their cardinals and um, the Communist Party would they'd sort of talk behind the scenes. The Communist Party would say, we're selecting them. And it was cool. But, um, you know, the Catholics make up a very small, I think it's what, like 13 million roughly? Less, 10. Less, 10. less than 1% of the population. Yeah. And, and there are something, the estimates range, but like 80 million roughly Protestants now in China? I'd say less, but 60 or something. 60. It doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, anyway, is... some in underground churches, um, some in the three selves church, self-propagating, self-help. What are the other two? Self-flagellating. <laughs> <laughs> um, ba basically, we have nothing to do with anyone outside of China. Um so there, there has been room to practice some religions in China. Hui Muslims can practice their religion. I think, I mean, having reported in Xinjiang multiple times, having reported in Tibet and in Tibetan areas of China, um, there's a very specific thing going on with ethnic groups in China. And, and it's, it's a very specific kind of, of crackdown um, where the government is worried about, uh, you know, groups wanting to have autonomy or independence and that's really what they're cracking down on more than religion. But they see religion as a vehicle through which people can, fe can be united and can interact with each other, you know, ostensibly in the mosque or in the temple. And um, so they, you know, based to some extent on the experience that previous uh, uh, governments in China have had over time, they don't want to let that ball get rolling because they're worried about where it would go. So... I'm not answering your question yet. You're asking, you're asking. So what would change it? I mean, I think the government has been trying to change the facts on the ground, so there really isn't a lot of resistance in the future. Whenever, you know, if the Communist Party ever were to not be the the party leading the country, there there wouldn't be that kind of resistance anymore coming from the Uyghurs or the Tibetans. I think you know, the end game could also be that. You know, some, some religions will play ball because there's a lot to be gained, just as the Orthodox Church in Russia shows. You can get a lot of state support. If you uh, work with the CCP, you can get new, um, uh, new cathedrals built. You can get new tr uh, temples built. And if you're against the party, then you'll probably go underground. And that's why I think, like, the end game, say, with the Catholic Church was to, from the party's point of view, was to bring them all into the official church. So there would be no more underground church. I don't think that will probably work. Um, but some of the, it'll actually could help some religions like Christianity because, you know, th at the end of 1949, when the communists took power, there were three million Catholics and one million Protestants. Protestantism grew rapidly in the intervening decades. Um, and I think part of it is that it doesn't depend as much on, on physical location. It isn't as infrastructure heavy. Like you can sort of have a Protestant church anywhere. Like you don't need to have, and it isn't as dependent on a clergy that's appointed by you know, various levels of, of authority. 
So these religions may go more underground again and then emerge in a more tolerant era. Like there was a more tolerant era in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's sort of over, 2000s, that's sort of over. But what we see now in China is not the China that will be there, you know, who knows, in 10 or 20 years. Things can change. In terms of more tolerant eras in the past, Xi Jinping's father was friendly with the Dalai Lama. Yeah, was also one of the reputed authors of the, you know, document 19, which was released in 1982, which explicitly allowed underground churches to practice and, and, and stuff like that and sort of laid the groundwork for the religious revival in the intervening for, in the, for the next, like, 20, 30 years. Um, but that just shows that the bloodlines don't mean exact same policy. I'm seeing Jeffrey point to someone back there oh. who has a mic. Yes, hi. Oh. Hi. Thank you guys so much. I uh, really appreciate the talk today. Um, just curious. So in 1949, obviously, uh, there was a huge split between China, um, the PRC, and the ROC in Taiwan. Um, do their conceptions of cosmology begin to kind of shift and define themselves in opposition to one another, especially given that hell, at least in the Western sense, tends to be kind of political and we tend to, you know, syncretize that which is otherwise in society with hell? Um, how do you kind of see those, you know, forms of those conceptions of cosmology forming in opposition to one another? I can't say I'm, I'm an expert on, on, on the Taiwanese uh, scene, uh, religious scene. It's my just, you know, sort of outsider, just, you know, sort of a, a look is that it seems to be a very pluralistic uh, religious landscape and a lot of the, the practice of, you know, that of the traditional sort of, you know, Chinese um, practice. And early on, the, uh, the uh, sort of Christianity was flourishing because it was this appeal to the elite, right, in the Taiwanese society, Chiang Kai-shek and his wife. And all, so all of these elites were, you know, they were Christian. Um, so Chiang Kai-shek had to be, you know, baptized, had to convert to Christianity you know, when uh, he was marrying uh, the Madame Song. So the so so the so there was a lot of that, but then the uh, sort of then the the uh, the sort of the uh, the the the, the um, so early on the other religious practice was actually more suppressed. But then the was the opening up of, of Taiwan um, democratization. Then the, you know sort of especially you know I'm more familiar with the Buddhist scene in in Taiwan that it was very very flourishing these uh, major Buddhist uh, sort of organizations that, you know, even uh, spread to, to the rest of the world that was headquarters in Taiwan. So they were very, very uh, sort of powerful movement, you know, and revival. And a lot of these were having the sort of mainland sort of, sort of trace back to the Chinese forms of Buddhism uh, in terms of their masters that their training was during the Republican era in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in China. Before forty nine, so so all, all I can see is you know it's much more pluralistic. And you you studied Chinese in Taiwan, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was emphasize what you said that I think that they that in Taiwan these uh, new uh, versions of Buddhism like Suji and Fo Guangshan, um, you know, Richard Madsen has that wonderful book called Democracy's Dharma, and he sort of posits that some of these religious organizations helped create the grassroots social structures that helped democratize Taiwan in the 70s and 80s, especially the 80s. Um, and that, you know, that, that sort of thing is lacking in China because you don't have those kind of independent religious organizations. So, yeah, I can only agree that it was, it's much more pluralistic in Taiwan. Mm. Let's take one or two more questions. I have one more question and we will wrap up. Um, so we have three questions here. We can take them all quickly. <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, go ahead. The mic's right there. Oh, thank you. So my question is more like under the uh, in Chinese context, how do you distinguish the uh, religious phenomenon and the cultural phenomenon? So, for example, like take my grandma's example. She believes in she believed in Maoism very firmly. Like she is she was actually. Um, Became a, gov a government official uh, in 1960s, like as a female, because she pushed to like she she believed in Maoism very much. And but uh, during New Year's, like Chinese Lunar New Year's, she will still perform a lot of like rituals to um, worship the ancestors. And but if you ask her, do you believe in ghosts or do you believe in uh, any like supernatural thing? She, she will tell you no. And uh, so to my understanding. I don't know if it's because she is living in this like cultural and uh, she's performing all these like ritual things because of cultural or it's just uh, like another 
different definition of religion. And also, we, when we were talking about Taiwan, and Taiwan has a very famous monk, uh, Xin, um, Xin Yun Da Shi, <coughs> and uh, his book was, um, his book, books are very popular in mainland China, and a lot of young people also read it. But if you go ask those young people, do you believe in Buddhism? They will tell you, no, I don't believe in Buddhism. So yeah, so basically that's my question. Uh, yeah, it's like how you distinguish the religious um, phenomena and the cultural phenomena. Right, as I said, you know, the Chinese um, religion, even in pre-modern China, is a very diffused phenomenon. Um, right, it you know, it didn't quite have the kind of organization that it, that uh, some of the Western counterparts have, and uh, of course, with the uh, with the onslaughts of you know of of communism, or Maoism, um, that 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 even becomes even more diffused. Um, so the uh, I don't think, I mean, I guess one way to think about this is that, you know, let's say in, in America, sometimes people say, oh, you know, so-and-so is culturally, you know, Catholic or culturally Jewish, meaning that it's, they don't necessarily believe in that, but then they sort of, they sort of follow the, the family practice, um, especially on certain occasions, right? I think that's, that's not really distinctly Chinese, right? It's uh, that they, they retain certain sort of cultural habits, that that's how they grew up, and that, that's, that's the sort of a way of life, and that's how they engage the, the sort of the world. And without consciously sort of holding the kind of belief that might have um, entail, uh, that might have been implied in certain kinds of practice. Um. Yeah. I think just to follow on the question, I'm wondering like, um, of course, like there is like a um, very ambiguous like um, definition between like culture and religious practice, but also like when you are writing about like um, what is happening in China to the Western audience, do you feel like sometimes there's like a limit in language that like, because like when you say like religion, that Western audience will have like their own assumption. Like, so how do you like kind of tackle this kind of like cultural difference in like language when you are trying to like convey to like one phenomenon to another society? Right. The whole concept of religion is a Western concept, right? And the, the term Zongjiao, that's in the contemporary translation, it was not Chinese in origin, right? It's so there was Jiao in, in, you know, in, in, in pre-modern China. There are three teachings. So Jiao meaning teaching, that there's the Confucian teaching, there's the Taoist teaching, there is the Buddhism, that's the San Jiao, you know, the, in pre So the, the whole phenomenon of, of the concept of religion is not an adopt, it, it's not simply an adoption of a term. It, it requires a restructuring of sort of of the way that the Chinese look at their own history, right? That mm -hmm. that it has because this is part of the sort of the um, the Westernization of the way that the Chinese uh, sort of look at you know uh, look at look at everything historically, and they adopted every aspect, right? You know, so so a lot of the terms has to be created, and often through Japan, Japanese, right? So the concept like philosophy. Concept like religion, concept like science, and, and, and all of these were recent creations. And, and that, because it didn't really exist in the way that we understood, you know, in, in the modern sort of the, the Western disciplinary terms. So, so it, it requires a very wholesome kind of transformation of the Chinese knowledge foundation. So in some ways to, 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 to say that it's, that somehow that there is a language barrier, but then there is a prior problem of that the very thing that we were talking about was actually a modern creation, which under the very influence of the West that we we're trying to compare. So bringing this home to our theme, mm -hmm. um, you've now lived in the States for a while, um, grew up in China. Um, if you look at how conceptions of hell have changed in China over time, I mean, and you look at what people think of it now in China? Two questions, actually. Like, how, how much of a difference do you see between what the understanding of it is here and what the understanding of it is in China now? And how different is that from, you know, in centuries past? Right, I think the, uh, because of the material condition that Ian was talking about, um, 
the, these sort of depiction of hell didn't quite have the presence that it had before, and mm -hmm. it wasn't quite performing the way that, that it performed like before, right? So, so it wasn't quite in the people's consciousness. That's why I was struck by your, um, by your comment saying that when people were, you know, performing these things, like funeral rituals, they were not specifically thinking about the hellish, you know, sort of, you know, what that people would sink into necessarily. So those are sort of more abstract, right? They're, they're sort of there, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of in the background, but that was not in the kind of very graphic depiction that you will see when there were a lot more temples, were a mm -hmm. lot more of these performances, a lot more of these, that's more on people's mind, right? So maybe if they're more, let's say, in a, you know, more movies about it, you know, sort of, and then that might actually change, you know, sort of Hell religious landscape, right? You know, so, yeah, because that, you know, and then a lot of these other sort of more modern kind of media, not so much the, in the in the sort of more physical aspect of the of the media, and that would, you know, probably do a lot, of, make a lot of change as well. Yeah, so. and, and for you, just go ahead, you were about to say. Well, no, I was going to say that I think it's, what strikes me also is the presence of some of these images in modern literature and, and film. Um, so, if, you know, Yu Hua, the famous novelist, has a book called The Seventh Day, which is about a, a man, as you find out through the course of the novel, he was killed in an explosion in a restaurant, and he, um, he's supposed to go to, to hell, which now has a crematorium, because in, in modern China you, you're cremated. Um, and he finds out that the VIPs have gotten ahead of him, and he has to take a number, and he can't get, and he has a whole day to kill. It turns out he'd come back later, just kind of like in the, a parody sort of of the old bureaucratic hell. And so he decides to wander around the town, and through that then you find out about his life and, and, and stuff like that. And then there's a new movie which just came out last year by the director Chiu Jong Jung, uh, which is a very interesting director um, called... I just wrote down, I just saw it, actually, of course, I forgot the, the name of it, called A New Old Play. And this is about the person who ran a Sichuan opera troupe, and he's called by Yama to go to hell, and then the, the, the movie is about uh, juxtaposing his re recollections of the past and his journey to the underworld. And so these things are still potent um, symbols, at least, for people creating works in China today. And I, I thought also for my... The book that I'm writing on underground histories and, and unofficial histories, people who are not part of the official historical writing in China, so many of them are just are, are motivated by this idea of wanting to give the dead a proper reckoning, that they, their story is told, um, because so often it's whitewashed by the party. So the, just to put a memorial up at a labor camp or something like that. And I think this idea that the dead aren't properly dead and settled until they have been honored properly. Um, that sort of, um, I think, is still very present in people's idio you know, minds. So what I was going to ask as a last question is just, um, you've spent... It's like a strobe light. You know? <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> Some <still> spirit <laughs> has controlled <laughs> the electrical thing. <laughs> Sorry. I, I had asked Tao about how like, outside influence may have changed the conception of hell within China. I'm just wondering for you, as you're looking as, as an outsider at China, I mean, what stands out for you is what is quintessentially Chinese in the conception of hell today, as opposed to what may have come in from elsewhere? Well, I think what strikes me still is maybe not to go over the same point here, but just the, the sort of the importance of funeral rites and that they, the, the dead rights. has to be given a proper funeral. You've got to do the right, the right things have to be done. You may, mm -hmm. that may involve in, inviting a religious specialist, in other words, a Taoist or Buddhist uh, priest or monk to come and do that, or you may have other ways of doing that, but that it has to be done sort of the right way, other th otherwise they're not sort of being taken care of properly. And I, I think that that um, is still, and the idea of also of karmic retribution, that, that what's the kind of life you live will have an impact later in your, in, in maybe in being reborn if you're a Buddhist, uh, if you're a devout Buddhist, you might mm -hmm. think of it along those lines. But that those, so these ideas are still, and they're very universal ideas, um, yeah. but that they're still potent, even if the physical infrastructure of temples and, and all of that are not so present. I wish we had more time, but this has been a great conversation. Tao Zhang, Ian Johnson, thank you so much. Thank you.